Hi, I'm John Gehagen, and welcome back to part four of my short story, The Eighth Dwarf, about Walt Disney's first animated feature. I don't know if anybody's still listening out there, but one thing I've learned while doing this process is that I have turkey neck, and unfortunately there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, in our last installment um, of our short story, uh, we had uh, Sleazy, the Eighth Dwarf, uh, dropping a dime on Walt Disney's bankers, the Bank of America in San Francisco, uh, forcing them to call Walt up to San Francisco to meet with the board to find out exactly how he was spending their money. Unfortunately, uh, Sleazy's attempt to get the, uh, the bankers to realize that uh, Walt was spending part of their production budget on providing drugs for Snow White uh, was not successful. So let's continue now with part four of The Eighth Dwarf. The premiere of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs took place on December 21st, 1937, just in time for the Christmas season. The opening was held at the Cathay Circle and an ornate mission-style theater on San Vicente that sat 1500. Giant searchlights parked in front announced the event. Four years later, those same lights would be used to search the sky for Japanese bombers. But nobody worried about that then. By the time we got there, the Cathay's bell tower was ablaze with lights. The huge marquee with Walt's name above the title could not be missed. Seven non-union dwarfs had been hired to parade outside the theater wearing oversized paper mache heads that were surprisingly poor likenesses. Even the giant Christmas tree out front was lost in all the hoopla. 30,000 people showed up that night, none of them with a ticket. It was bedlam in the streets. Walt and Lillian needed a police escort to get through the crowd. Still, when they pulled up to the theater, Walt looked cool as a cucumber. Wearing white tie and tails with a scarf draped elegantly around his neck, no one would have guessed his entire future depended on what happened inside that theater over the next two hours. Sleazy wasn't at the premiere because he wasn't invited. But Clark Gable was there, as was Cecil B. DeMille, Carol Lombard, Charlie Chaplin, Marlena Dietrich, Ginger Rogers, and Cary Grant. When the house lights went down, you could hear the audience murmuring in anticipation. Except for Fault Walt's five-year-old daughter breaking into tears every time the old crone came on, Snow White was a triumph. When Walt, at the audience's behest, was called on stage to acknowledge their ovation, there were tears in his eyes. As everybody knows, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs went on to become a monster hit, the highest grossing movie ever made at the time. It earned Walt so much respect he craved that he made the cover of Time magazine and was uh, awarded honorary degrees from Harvard and Yale. Even the Daily Worker praised the film, which drove Walt crazy, since the only thing he hated more than Jews were communists. Snowy's performance was fantastic. The picture's Germanic setting was custom-made for her, when the Oscars were awarded a year later, Shirley Temple presented Walt with one regular-sized Oscar and seven smaller ones for the dwarves. Sleazy didn't, Sleazy didn't get one because Walt had fired him, but everyone knew the regular-sized Oscar was for Snowy. There's no denying Snow White elevated cartoons to a height never deemed possible, but that wasn't its only success. Five months after the premiere, movie's premiere, Walt retired our entire debt obligation to the Bank of America. Although things were going swimmingly for Walt, they weren't so hot for Snow White and her single dwarf. You see, Sleazy, at Snow White's insistence, had procured an abortion for her. Unfortunately, the operation could only be performed the night of the premiere. Their plan was to meet once the film had finished playing when Sleazy would drive Snow White to the procedure. After it was over, they intended on driving to Mexico to get married. It was anyone's guess what would happen after that. The night before the premiere, Snowy was nervous. 
She wasn't worried about her American debut. She was concerned about the procedure. When she finally got Sleazy on the phone, he could tell she was worked up. Sleazy, I don't think I can go through with this. What, getting married? No, the operation. How do we know it's safe? Don't worry, Snowy, I know the guy. He's done it a thousand times. But how do we know we can trust him? You know him, Snowy. He's in the picture. Our picture? Is it a dwarf? Of course he is. Why do you think they call him Doc? It took Sleazy more than an hour to calm Snowy down after that. But in the end, she trusted him, which is more than she could say about Walt Disney. I love you, Sleazy. You know that, don't you? Not as much as I love you, kid. Now get some sleep. Sleazy showed up the next night, just as the premiere was letting out. They'd agreed to meet at the fountain in front of the theater, but the crowd was so thick, it was hard to push through, and the jack-booted cops weren't making it easy. When Sleazy finally reached the fountain, Snow White was nowhere to be seen. Since the crowd was nearly impassable, Sleazy made his way towards Vincente Boulevard. When he reached the barricade, he ducked under, which is when he saw Walt hustling Snow White into a chauffeured limousine. Sleazy called out her name. When Snow White turned, she gave him an imploring look. Then Walt pushed her into the back of the car, slammed the door, and she was gone. As Sleazy watched uncomprehendingly, Walt made his way through the crowd accompanied by two police thugs. He wore a black fur-trimmed overcoat, which perfectly matched the darkness of the night. As the policemen parted the crowd, Walt approached Sleazy wearing a smile that said he'd won. Snow White isn't joining you tonight, Sleazy. She got cold feet. What do you mean, cold feet? She's pregnant with your child. That's none of your concern, Sleazy. It's all been taken care of. You've done nothing but exploit that girl, Mr. Disney. What, Sleazy? Did you think she was going to marry you? Have you looked in a full-length mirror lately? Where is she going? I've arranged a little trip for Snow White. Everything will be swell. I find that hard to believe, Mr. Disney. You could have played this differently, Sleazy. Instead, you involved my bankers. That's an unpardonable offense. Since when do you make the rules around here? Disney nodded at the marquee since my picture is a triumph. A triumph for you, maybe, but at what cost to the rest of us? Walt shook his head. By the way, Sleazy, Snow White had a message for you. What's that? Auf Wiedersehen. And with that, Walt turned toward the theater, leaving Sleazy to be swallowed up by the crowd. The next few years were ones of uncertainty for Walt and Sleazy. Walt knew he had to top Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, but how? I have to prove Snow White wasn't a novelty, he said, pounding his desk. But as time wore on, that's exactly what it looked like. Snow White had raised the bar so high it was impossible for Walt to go back to cartoon shorts. He brief, briefly fooled around with automating animation, something that had endeared him to no one in the studio. Then in 38, Pinocchio was released. Pinocchio lost so much money, Walt was forced to increase the company's credit line. Two years later, when Fantasia came out, he had another bomb. Baby boomers today remember Fantasia as something they smoked pot at during a midnight showing in college. But when that movie was first released with Mickey as the Sorcerer's Apprentice, it was a financial disaster. After that, Disney Studios was $5 million in the red and on the brink of going under. Two flops in a row really shook Walt up. We all make our mistakes, he told the dinner audience at the 1940 Academy Awards, but I should have a medal for bravery. 
Then he began to cry. When Walt released Bambi in 42, it was another disaster. It didn't help that the film's composer blew his brains out with a shotgun. The studio's mood was glum. Once again, Walt was summoned to San Francisco to deal with the financiers. Movies didn't have the ancillary revenue streams they have today. You made your entire nut during the film's first run. After that, you were either in the black or not. In Walt case, Walt's case, it was not. When Bank of America threatened to force Disney into bankruptcy, Walt had little choice. Budget cuts and salary reductions quickly followed. To keep the studio solvent, Walt turned to making commercials, but his heart wasn't in it. As the financial news tightened, Walt's nose for pleasing an audience began to falter. His mood, which had always been outwardly lighthearted, began to darken. People commented on how he'd stop in the middle of a conversation to stare off into space. It was weird. In the meantime, Sleazy searched high and low for Snow White. At first, he assumed she was in Los Angeles, but when he couldn't find her, he broadened his search to the rest of California. That, too, proved futile. Eventually, Sleazy put the word out to Chicago and New York, but nobody had seen her. Despite this period, Sleazy struggled to find work. He missed the entire Wizard of Oz thing in 39 when Walt put word out not to hire him. Too bad, because Sleazy would have loved Judy Garland. She was as crazy as Snow White, maybe crazier, but MGM wouldn't touch him. It didn't help the cartoon shorts weren't hiring unless you had a sidekick. Tom and Jerry did boffo box office, but Walt's embargo guaranteed Sleazy remained a single act. Jobs for dwarfs are few and far between at the best of times. The Depression only made things worse. Sleazy couldn't even get a reel in an, in an Our Gang comedy. Things got so bad, he volunteered for the Navy, but couldn't pass the height requirement. Finally, he gave up looking and began hitting the bottle. Those were the dark years for Sleazy. It didn't take much to get the little guy loaded, and it, after a while, the only place you could find him was under a certain bridge in Bakersfield. There he spent the day with a bottle of Matus and a wicked cough. Talk about the grapes of wrath. How he lived through that period, I'll never know. It would have killed a lesser dwarf. After that, I only heard rumors of his whereabouts. Some people said Sleazy had joined a sex act in Tijuana, though I found that hard to believe. Others claimed he was living in Encino. Like a lot of Hollywood rumors, there was nothing to them. But whatever Sleazy was doing, wherever he was doing it, he was bumping along the bottom. Thanks again for listening. Stay tuned for part five.